Before the two-week vacation, I took a lot of time to put everything in order. Leaning back in my chair at my desk, I slowly admired the beautiful landscape outside the window. Suddenly, I was interrupted by the pleasant voice of my assistant. Well, Luke, are you ready for the big day? What is it? She asked. I replied, I'm more ready than ever, Melanie. I haven't been through this before. Melanie added with a touch of humor, Make this marriage strong, boss. We don't need you to break marriage records for ten years. I couldn't help but smile at her teasing. You're really picking on me, aren't you? I asked playfully. She replied, Maybe a little bit. I understand that you are a genuinely kind person and don't have to deal with all this nonsense. Are you ready to fly out? Is there anything in particular I should be doing in your absence? No, I think we've already discussed everything. I appreciate your offer to take a vacation after Wednesday in connection with the upcoming wedding. I plan to relax in the pub tonight and take a break before diving into the complicated details on Thursday and Friday. I feel relieved that we have chosen a small wedding. By the way, won't you inform the HR department if your assistant hugs you warmly? I've never done this before. Melanie has become one of my dearest friends and holds a truly special place in my heart since I hired her almost a decade ago, shortly after taking up a position at Personal Wealth Financial. The memories of the interview with her are still stored in my memory. Despite her impressive resume, my first impression of her was this. She looked somewhat rustic, thin, with a shy and reserved demeanor. I couldn't help but notice the slight redness around her nose and the darkness under her eyes. Despite this, I was so intrigued by her potential that I invited her for a second interview. At that moment, I was confronted with an extraordinary force of nature endowed with a rich character. Of course, her appearance did not meet the generally accepted standards of beauty in society. But I soon discovered that she had unsurpassed self-confidence and charisma, radiating a charm that even the most stunning girls I knew would envy. Undoubtedly, her husband was a lucky man. In search of solace, I decided to relax at my favorite pub, conveniently located near my home in Kirkland, Washington, and treat myself to a light dinner. Kaylee, the bartender, has played many roles in my life over the years. Her amazing red hair gracefully framed the weathered face of the woman who became my second mother and closest confidant. In a relaxed and disturbing manner, let me describe this scene. When she was younger, I think she had a certain charm, but hardships and smoking left their mark on her features by the age of 40. Despite this, her inner beauty shone for me. She witnessed my lowest moments and always found the perfect words of comfort. The pub was relatively empty, the familiar smell of fried food was in the air, and the atmosphere seemed to offer solace for raw emotions. As I approached the bar, Kelly's gaze met mine, and a warm smile graced her face. Ah, Mr. Three Cheaters to the Wind, how is my favorite client? She asked. Hi, Kaylee. Are you still attached to your partner, or do you mind running away with me? I wouldn't want to disrupt your plans for a special day with your beautiful bride. It's the same as usual, Luke. As Kaylee hurried to the bar, I couldn't help but notice a charming lady sitting alone a few seats away from me. Judging by her appearance, I estimated her age at about 35 years and above. She had a faint smile on her face, as if she was amused by the conversation I was having with Kaylee. Wanting to be friendly, I decided to say hello. Hello? When I stood in front of her, she wrinkled her forehead and glared at me suspiciously. It looks like you're not drunk. I raised an eyebrow in response. I have to say it's a pretty intriguing greeting. I assured her, no, I'm not drunk. It seems that the barmaid spread a rumor that I was very drunk. I assumed she thought you were drunk. Oh, I chuckled. That's just her nickname for me, but it's not three infidelities. The woman's face distorted even more, indicating that she did not like something. She seemed to bite her lip even harder. Another man who can't control his desires, her expression seemed to say. While I was about to speak, Kaylee quickly put my beer on the table and came to my rescue. Lady, 
Luke is one of the kindest and most loyal men I've ever met. He wasn't the one who cheated. A wave of sadness swept over her face, and her trembling lips hinted that tears were about to come. Feeling an emotional explosion approaching, I nervously stretched out my hand, trying to greet her and diffuse the situation. I'm Luke, I offered. I'm sorry. She hastily shook my hand as if disgusted by human interaction. No, I should be the one apologizing. It can be said that I have been the victim of infidelity countless times. You can just call me Linda. Nice to meet you, Linda. I'm sorry this is a sensitive topic. But my joke seemed to cheer her up considerably. I don't like it when a woman cries, so her change in behavior came as a pleasant surprise to me. Yes, this is definitely a sensitive topic, but I have a feeling that there is an intriguing story behind your three cases of infidelity. I suppose so, but I'm not sure if you're interested in learning about it. Please continue, Luke, Kaylee interrupted. It sounds exciting, Linda pretended to pout. You won't give me a choice, will you? I asked, hoping for a different answer. They both answered in unison, no. Resigned, I sighed and wondered where to start. Well, let's start with the news. Harper, life is not going the way we expect. I already knew my marriage was falling apart long before our first anniversary. Strangely enough, I wasn't devastated by his ending, but it left a dent in my self-confidence. Thinking about the past, I remembered how Harper and I started dating in our senior year of high school. At that time, I was an inexperienced 18-year-old teenager, and she, on the contrary, was 18, and she was far from innocent. I wasn't actively looking for her, but circumstances brought us together through a group of friends. Although I should have refused, my impulsive desires got the better of my logical thinking. My teammates cornered me in the locker room after the game, doubting that I didn't have a decent quarterback partner. They started talking about Aubrey again. Despite the lack of a romantic relationship, she holds a special place on my list of best friends. They insisted that I needed more open partners in an intimate way. They thought it was time for me to lose my virginity. I firmly said that I did not need their help in finding intimacy and asked them to step back. Ted intervened, trying to calm me down. Hi Luke, I'm sorry about that. The thing is, Harper told my girlfriend that she was interested in you. Although Harper is attractive, she tends to get into relationships with anyone who shows interest. That's not what I want. But she's not like that with everyone. She's actually sweet and has genuine feelings for you. I'm inviting you to my party tomorrow night where she will be present. Maybe we'll just see if there's any connection between you. By the way, the guys were very rude to my friend Aubrey. She didn't fit into the stereotype of a slim, model-like person, but she was exactly my type. She had the charming appearance of a girl from the next yard, which I was sure would remain stunning even in middle age. Although we had never officially met, our constant communication did not allow us to notice the difference. To tell the truth, I found her exquisitely beautiful both on the outside and inside. If it were up to me, I would have wanted us to become each other's first romantic partners, but she possessed a moral principle that I deeply admired and sought to emulate. Growing up together within the walls of the church, I tried to remain faithful to my beliefs. Unfortunately, the weak defense that I had built around my purity was crumbling under the influence of teenage desires. It's time to face reality. I really wanted to find someone to have an intimate relationship with at Ted's party. Harper approached me with firm determination, like a missile aiming at its intended target. Ted mentioned you'd be here, Luke. Hi, Harper, you look great. In fact, you look irresistible. Oh, well, that's not what I meant. Don't worry, Luke, I'm just teasing you. But she wasn't really teasing me. Within an hour, we were kissing passionately, and less than half the night had passed, as she completely changed my idea of intimate pleasure. I was seized with a strong desire. Aubrey immediately felt how I had changed. Despite the fact that she looked offended, she accepted my departure to the dark side. A few weeks later, she started dating Dennis, a member of our team. Knowing that Aubrey prefers not to rush things, I teased them, 
But she wasn't amused by my attempts at humor, and Dennis asked me to stop. I apologized to both of them and felt embarrassed about my changed behavior. The way they greeted me made me feel ashamed of my changed attitude. But in the end, I was just a stupid teenager. Gradually, I drifted away from Aubrey and Dennis. Looking back, I realized that I was immersed in a personal darkness, which made me uncomfortable with the light they radiated. I longed for carelessness and joy, but their presence next to me seemed to drown out my joy. During the rest of the school year and the following summer, Harper and I embarked on a journey of dating and self-discovery. Our physical relationship was exciting because she possessed undeniable attractiveness and skill. In addition, she turned out to be an easy conversationalist, and we discovered many common interests and views. Over time my feelings for her deepened, and I realized that I had fallen in love. In the fall, Harper intended to enroll at Washington State University, and after receiving a football scholarship, I went to Indiana to continue my studies at Purdue. Despite my growing affection for her, I realized that maintaining a long-distance relationship would not be easy for both of us. Therefore, we made a mutual decision to refrain from exclusivity and agreed to meet when we return home. In my first two years of college, my penchant for hanging out dominated my life. As promised, Harper and I talked again during our classes together, but deliberately avoided discussing our separation experiences. This tacit understanding turned out to be wise for both of us. I found myself constantly comparing all the girls I dated to Harper, and none of them met my expectations. My longing for her grew stronger every day, and I was looking forward to our next meeting. I started contacting her more often, and she seemed to feel the same way. Despite the thousands of miles between us, my love for her continued to grow. When I started my junior year, I felt a sense of maturity and responsibility. The values instilled in me as a child began to flood my mind, and I was tired of the emptiness that accompanied my dissolute lifestyle. After that moment, all my attention was focused on Harper, and I began to think about the idea of proposing to her. As our senior year approached, I felt the need to find out what Harper thought of our relationship. Darling, can we have a serious talk? I asked. Of course, Luke. Is everything all right? You look a little gloomy, she replied. After gathering my thoughts, I confessed. Well, I've been thinking a lot lately and I have to admit that in the first two years of college I was a little reckless with other girls. But I've always loved you, and deep down I knew that we would definitely find our way to each other. But at that time, I easily succumbed to the attention and accessibility of other women. Have you had the same experience with other guys? Yes. I've had casual relationships with a few, but deep down I've always dreamed it would be you. There was just no comparison, you know? Yes, I understand. I assumed you were dating other guys and I didn't mind. That's what we agreed. But this year everything has changed for me. It began to seem to me that I was unfaithful and I realized that I wanted to be completely devoted to you. I wanted you to know that since the last time we were together in the summer, I haven't even kissed another girl. I was hoping that you could assure me that you feel the same way. I only love you, Luke. Will you marry me and spend the rest of our lives together? I asked when Harper excitedly jumped onto my lap, bouncing up and down and shouting, Yes, yes, yes! After making love, we lay next to each other, sharing dreams of the future. But suddenly a worried expression appeared on Harper's face as she sat up. Do you think it's a good idea to get married before graduation? What is it? She asked, wanting to clarify the situation. No, I reassured her. Maybe a few months after we graduate from college. Harper visibly relaxed, and although her practicality caused me some concern, I couldn't help but wonder what she was thinking. I also realized that I had never received a proper answer to the question of her recent fidelity. But she somehow managed to convince me of her unwavering loyalty to me. At first it was a small worry in the back of my mind, but over time it surfaced and began to haunt me. After graduating from university, Harper got a job at a real estate company, and I started my career at Personal Wealth Financial Planning. 
We tied the knot in December of that year, and I considered myself satisfied. My desire to regain the faith that was embedded in me during my upbringing remained strong. It soon became clear that Harper did not have a penchant for spirituality. Over time, I began to understand that living together with a person allows me to understand his true nature more deeply. I didn't have to wait long after our wedding to encounter the first sign. Harper persuaded me to interrupt our honeymoon in California so that we could celebrate the new year with her college friends, most of whom I knew well. Throughout the evening I barely saw my newlywed wife. The party was held in a rented ballroom, to which we all contributed. Harper was running around the room, chatting animatedly with everyone present. At times it was difficult for me to keep track of her whereabouts. Some of her close friends were bothering me, as if it was their duty for the evening. In the end, I had to carry the unconscious Harper to our car and safely enter the apartment. She was remorseful and sincerely apologized for her behavior at the party, which made me ignore it. But over time, a growing unease settled in my mind. Harper had a lot of evening commitments, but she didn't talk about the specifics of her work and personal life. There were times when I was acutely aware that her friends ranked higher on her list of priorities. It puzzled me how, despite being married for less than a year, I still felt lonely. Another year has passed, and it's time for the annual New Year's Eve celebration in the same place. Deep down, I didn't really want to be there, but I felt obligated to watch Harper behave alone with his friends. I thought that without my presence, I had a better chance of seeing the real Harper. So I plucked up the courage and canceled the meeting at the 11th hour, citing an upset stomach. Surprisingly, Harper seemed almost relieved by my decision to stay at home. After letting the party go on for several hours, I showed up around 10. Upon arrival, I intended to remain inconspicuous. It didn't take me long to spot Harper from across the room. She attracted the attention of six guys who surrounded her and began kissing passionately, replacing each other. Eventually, I noticed how she pulled one of them by the hand and led him into the next corridor, which led to the training halls of the dance class. Meanwhile, the other guys stood aside, exchanging greetings and giving the impression that they were waiting for their turn. I stood there for a while, thinking about what was the best thing to do. Filled with determination, I felt an irresistible desire to witness what was about to happen. Ignoring Amy, Harper's friend, I walked briskly across the room, but my actions did not go unnoticed by Amy, who was obviously informed of my presence. Luke, Harper said you weren't well, she said trying to block my way. Dismissing her request, I firmly replied, Get out of the way, Amy. Grabbing her hands, I glared at her, looking for answers. Why? What will I learn if I continue? Amy's body trembled with fear as she tried to find the words. My anger was palpable, and I didn't try to hide it. Luke, you're not going to like this. Please change your mind, she begged desperately. She truly loves you. Brushing her off, I moved on deciding to meet my wife. In the training room, I was shocked to see my wife having an intimate act with a man she had voluntarily brought with her. The initial impulse was to rush into the room and engage in a fight with them, expressing his displeasure. But I managed to remain unnoticed and quietly take a few pictures on my phone, after which I calmly went home. When I got to our apartment, I carefully selected one of the photos and put it on the table next to my wedding ring. It was a silent but powerful statement about the betrayal I had just witnessed. After collecting enough clothes for a week, I packed up and went to the Holiday Inn. In the hotel room I experienced a whirlwind of emotions. I felt a mixture of sadness, as if tears were going to come at any moment, and an overwhelming desire to release my pent-up anger. The atmosphere was surreal and I tried to find a suitable outlet for my emotions. On the contrary, it seemed to me that all the questions that were accumulating in my head had finally been answered. I decided to keep her in the dark for a few days while I looked for a small furnished apartment. As soon as I found such an apartment, I called her to arrange a meeting and talk. Luke, where are you? How could you just leave like that? 
What is it? She asked, her voice full of concern. I'll come over tonight to talk. And then she interrupted me. Luke, please forgive me for what you saw. But I quickly silenced her. Shut up, Harper. We'll talk tonight. I'll be there at seven. I hung up the phone, desperately looking for some semblance of emotion to grab onto. All I felt was a deep emptiness engulfing me. Despite the anger and the blow to my ego, I was overwhelmed by a wave of relief. Although I had invested more than a year in her, the realization of who Harper really was confirmed my growing suspicions. Our relationship has never been really right. Memories of a conversation I had with my father many years ago popped into my head. We were discussing love and relationships, and I asked him how I would know when I found the right woman. His words echoed in my ears. It's different for everyone. But when you kiss her, perhaps your knees will weaken, or maybe you will feel a glow, as if electricity ran through your veins. It can manifest itself in different ways, but one thing is for sure. You will understand. I couldn't remember feeling such a deep connection with Harper. Of course, our kisses were passionate, but as I now understand, they were only physical. I have never felt that genuine connection that my father often talked about. So to my surprise, I found myself surprisingly unaffected. Well, okay, I was still disappointed with her behavior, but I was quite coping with myself. Without bothering to knock, I confidently entered the apartment at 7 o'clock. Harper was sitting at the kitchen table, her gaze fixed on the photo in my ring, her demeanor calm and resigned to the inevitable. In a few simple words, she captured the essence of our situation. We're done, aren't we? I sat down opposite her, waiting for an outburst or a tirade. Aren't you going to scream or vent your frustration? What is it? She asked. The answer surprised Harper. Why would that be? I probably should, but I won't. It's clear to me now, Harper, that I've finally seen your true self. And to be honest, we're not meant to be together. Even more telling, at least from my point of view, is that I don't believe I've ever truly loved you the way two people in a marriage should love each other. I don't believe that you love me like that either. Let's break up, maintain a respectful relationship and move forward. Surprisingly, the lack of an emotional reaction took me by surprise. She just shrugged, expressing her thoughts more convincingly than her next words. Maybe I wasn't really ready for marriage. Although I wanted to be ready, you were the man I imagined the future with, and I longed to be the woman and wife you wanted. Truly so. You're right. I'm just not like that. At the bar today, Linda seemed lost in thought as I finished the chapter on Harper. How fortunate that you discovered the truth in the early stages of your marriage. It took me 14 years to realize that my own marriage was built on deception. Please don't misinterpret my words, but I can feel the suffering written on your face when you discuss this. Regardless of the duration, revealing the truth can be painful, but it allows us to move forward with newfound wisdom. Leaning my elbow on the bar, I rested my head on my hand and looked into her eyes. Some feeling inside me insists that I need to hear your story too. I'm recovering slowly, but I can argue with you. I will tell my story in time, but we have just begun your narration, and I can't wait to hear everything. If necessary, take comfort in the fact that it ends on a positive note. Perhaps this will cheer you up. Linda paused for a moment, lost in her thoughts. Are you still in touch with Harper? From time to time, she faced difficulties after our divorce. It made her grow up quickly. Fortunately, she is doing well now, and she has found a wonderful partner. They seem to bring out the best in each other. You're not the kind of person who enjoys seeing their ex suffer in the hope that karma will come back to haunt him, are you? By no means, especially in this form. I absolutely don't want anyone to get sick or experience any kind of chaos. Besides, I still feel positive about Harper. We parted amicably. So who is the second person in question? I couldn't help but chuckle at the idea of number two. This is an appropriate way to describe how my relationship with Zoe developed. 
I first met Zoe at a party hosted by our mutual friends, Aubrey and Dennis. Aubrey and Dennis tied the knot in college, and after graduation, Dennis took a high position in a well-known production company. It is noteworthy that at such a young age, he was already promoted to the position of vice president. In finance, a couple moved to Dallas, and their friends gathered in the elegant Hyatt ballroom to say goodbye to them and express their wishes. While engaged in conversation with my interlocutor, I suddenly noticed that Zoe Walston entered the hall, from whom an aura of glamour and grace emanated. She was really breathtaking, and everyone was shocked. I later found out that her photo graced the cover of Maxim magazine almost a year ago. All the men, including me, could not contain their amazement. Although most of those present were married and accompanied by their devoted spouses, an amusing incident suddenly occurred. The wives acted quickly and skillfully, implementing a defense strategy that even the most astute military general would have admired. Almost all the men were involved in deep conversations initiated by their spouses. Being one of the three remaining single men, I couldn't help but feel a surge of apprehension when Zoe fixed her gaze on me with hunger in her eyes. I watched her purposefully make her way towards me, and a sudden fear gripped me when I realized that my inner desires might soon become annoyingly obvious. Hello, I'm Zoe, she introduced herself. Am I wrong? Or have a significant number of women just claimed ownership of their partners? I have a feeling that it wasn't just your imagination. By the way, my name is Luke. When she shook my hand, her touch sent a shiver down my spine. Nice to meet you, Zoe. Women probably see me as a potential threat. It looks like you don't have anyone to keep you on a leash. No, my relationship ended a few months ago, and yes, you definitely pose a threat. You must know how stunning you are. Thank you, but you are no less magnificent. My cheeks burned with warmth as I hurriedly searched for a suitable answer. Can we take time for each other's beauty? Her laugh was just amazing. Luke, I really like your sense of humor. Maybe we should spend some time together and get to know each other better? That's exactly what we did. She was smart and charming. Our conversation flowed easily and naturally, and I was completely charmed. It seemed that she was no less interested in me. When the party came to an end, Zoe and I agreed to meet the next evening. She had to leave a little earlier, which allowed me to catch up with Aubrey and Dennis. Aubrey was still the same, naturally beautiful girl I remembered from school. Her physique has not undergone much change, but in my opinion, she was still flawless. When I approached her, she greeted me with a slight frown. Hey Casanova! Did Zoe manage to capture you? We had a good friendship. I asked why, and she warned me to be careful. You know that Dennis and I care about you very much and we don't want you to get hurt again. She seems harmless, and I genuinely like her. Luke, my friend, I love you. Please open your eyes. You're repeating a familiar cycle. I felt slightly flustered by Aubrey's swearing. How could she assume that I didn't realize what I was getting into? I'll be fine. After all, we just met. I haven't gotten to the point of getting married yet, but she's smart and successful so she has a lot of advantages. Just promise me you'll be careful. Please take care of your heart. It's a kind heart, and you're an amazing person. You deserve to find a woman who is worthy of you. Zoe and I didn't waste any time. We were in perfect harmony when it came to making important life decisions. It didn't take long. And six months after we met, we entered into a marriage alliance. I expressed my strong desire to be faithful, and she seemed to share the same feelings. Given her obvious devotion to faith, I thought we had all the conditions for a long-term relationship. As the owner of a modest modeling agency, she prioritized maintaining a healthy work-life balance. Our marriage was simple, but filled with optimism for the years ahead. Our house had a warm and cozy atmosphere and our intimate moments were incredibly passionate. Zoe has always been faithful to our marriage, leaving me in no doubt about her commitment to monogamy. Three years of marital bliss have only strengthened our desire to create a family. 
Although she was enthusiastic about the idea, I couldn't help but notice that she never took the necessary steps to conceive a child. For example, she didn't stop using contraceptives, as we agreed. Despite this, I was on cloud nine and felt incredibly happy to have Zoe by my side. But as they say, just when it seems to you that everything is perfect, and your life is moving in the right direction, fate decides to throw you a crooked ball. On a gloomy and damp Monday, I faced one of the most nightmarish days of my life. At dawn, the phone rang in my office, breaking the usual silence. It was Aubrey, who rarely contacted me during office hours. From the tone of her voice, I immediately sensed that something was wrong. I asked anxiously, my concern was obvious. Don't worry, but I think you should know, she replied, her voice trembling. Dennis has leukemia. In shock, I muttered. Aubrey sighed heavily, a mixture of fatigue and distress in her voice. I just got back from the doctor's office, she said. He mentioned that there are various treatment options now. Let's hope he's right. Worried about her well-being, I asked. Are you holding up well? After recovering a little, Aubrey replied, yes. The doctor was optimistic, which came as a surprise to us. We did not expect this, although we noticed his recent fatigue. But knowing Dennis, he pulled on a facade of positivity, which I easily saw. Please keep us informed, okay? She tried to sound hopeful, but I knew her too well. Beneath her encouraging words, there was a deep fear and an overwhelming sense of hopelessness. I really wanted to be there to hug both my friends, but it was impossible. Our usual communication was limited to a monthly phone call. After that moment, I made a firm decision to increase my support to at least weekly. Despite the fact that we were thousands of kilometers apart, my friend desperately needed me. But our conversation ended abruptly, and I was overcome with depression. I seemed to be engulfed by an irresistible wave of anxiety as I looked out of my office window at the bleak, rainy landscape. While I was thinking about this sad news, I was interrupted by another close friend, my personal assistant Melanie, who came into my office with a light step and closed the door behind her. Her flushed face and red eyes indicated that she had been crying, and I assumed she had received the same upset news about Dennis and Aubrey. I made a mistake. Luke, you know that you are very dear to me and I would never intentionally hurt you, right? Mel, you're making me nervous. What's happening? I've been worried about this all weekend, but it's important for you to know. On Saturday, my husband and I celebrated our anniversary by having dinner and going dancing. We decided to visit a jazz club in the city center and... She began to cry. My mind raced, trying to anticipate what she was going to tell me. And then it dawned on me. On Saturday, Zoe was supposed to attend a partner meeting in Portland, and she stayed there overnight. What's the matter, Mel? Your wife was there with another man, and they... I took some pictures. Oh God, I'm so sorry, Luke. The pictures were very candid. They captured moments of intimate touching under the table, grinding on the dance floor and passionate kisses. Tears were streaming down my face, reminding me of the flowing waters of Snoqualmie Falls. First, the devastating news from Dennis and Aubrey shocked me so much, and now Zoe has betrayed me. Melanie hugged me tightly and apologized. When I came to my senses, I thanked her for telling me about it, and apologized for Zoe's destructive behavior during their weekend. Mel sent me the photos, and I decided to print out the most explicit ones to use in the future. I immediately recognized him as one of the models under Zoya's guidance. To get up the courage for the upcoming confrontation, I stopped by the pub on my way home. Fortunately, Kaylee was there and helped me calm down. When I entered the pub, I was surprised to see a couple of my old football buddies enjoying their vacation. I had no idea that they had developed a plan to teach Zoe's lover a lesson. I later found out that they had successfully tracked him down and engaged him in combat. Although I regretted that they hadn't taken matters into their own hands, I couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction. Waiting for Zoe to come home seemed like an eternity, and my stomach rumbled with nervous anticipation. While my emotions were wildly fluctuating, 
My mind was constantly switching between anger, hatred, regret, thoughts of forgiveness, and pain. In the end, she entered the room dispassionately, finding me already sitting at the dining table and ready to present my exhibits. Despite my inner turmoil, she came in looking cheerful and sweet. Hello, baby, she greeted, leaning in for a kiss. But I instinctively pushed her away, saying, Sit down. She hurriedly sat down, almost hitting a chair. Luke, why are you talking to me like that? What is it? She asked with obvious confusion in her voice. Unable to give a clear answer, I began to arrange the photos on the table one by one. Maybe I should talk to you in some other way? I asked, disappointment in my tone. She took a quick glance at the first photo she saw and immediately turned pale. Her tears were streaming freely down her face, a sight that would have moved me a day ago. But now they just push me away. How could you miss the part about loyalty? Luke, what's the matter? What are you going to say? It's just a physical act. It doesn't matter at all. You're the only one I love. What can you say to fix this situation? Please don't hate me. Take a few days to calm down. I promise I will never. I will never do it again. How many times have you done this with this guy? And with the other guys? I am amazed at your betrayal, especially considering that you knew about Harper's infidelity. It's quite obvious that you lack the understanding of a woman like me. My anger surged through me, reaching a boiling point. Grabbing her by the neck, I brought her face close to mine and burst into a deafening scream. I have fully comprehended your true nature. Calling you a pig would be an insult to pigs. You completely deceived me, didn't you? I'm sure you and your lover enjoyed discussing me while he was taking you away from me. Afraid of my own actions, I pushed her away. When I looked into her eyes, the unmistakable presence of fear caused conflicting emotions in me. It was an unsettling mix of satisfaction and apprehension. Unable to bear her face any longer, I turned away, seeking solace and pulling away from her before finding the courage to address her calmly. The realization hit me like a sledgehammer blow. I will never comprehend the mind of a deceiver or a traitor. You artfully deceived me, leaving me in a complete stupor. The very foundation of trust that we built has shattered into irreparable fragments. The pain you've caused me has surpassed anything I've ever experienced, and I have to grudgingly acknowledge your success in destroying me. I came to a sobering realization of your true nature, and it became clear that trusting you again would be a blatant mistake. While my anger boiled, I paced back and forth, trying to regain control of myself and her quiet sobs filled the air. I need you to leave this house tonight. My lawyer is currently working on the divorce papers and since you made a mistake with the prenuptial agreement, it has entered into force. You have 30 minutes to pack your things and we can discuss the rest of the issues by text message. When I turned to leave, she started crying loudly, but I remained indifferent. Luke, I'm asking you. You're the only one I love. Please don't do this. I stopped, turning away from Zoe, and looked at the floor. Love. Well, I don't feel that way about you anymore. When I look at you, I see only ugliness and nothing that I would like. I refuse to hear declarations of love from you. Love is not capable of causing the harm and pain that you have caused me. It is quite obvious that your love is directed exclusively at yourself. I urge you to leave immediately before I strike back, and I advise your boyfriend to run too. Linda carefully shared her observations, noting that my reaction seemed unexpectedly violent to her. Despite our recent acquaintance, she believed that I had a kinder and softer character. Kaylee supported her, noting that I am the embodiment of these qualities, kindness and gentleness. But when I'm faced with betrayal, even the most submissive people can unleash their inner demons. I must admit that my own emotions may have clouded my judgment to some extent. Linda, it's obvious that you felt the pain of being cheated on, so maybe you can understand my situation. When it came to Harper, I always knew deep down that we weren't meant for each other. However, with Zoe, 
I sincerely believed that she was the one, but my heart was broken again. I admit that in a fit of frustration I said hurtful things to her, but not out of a desire to cause physical harm, but rather to cause emotional pain. Despite this, my words were true. Whether she learns it or not remains to be seen. How did events develop after that? Did you manage to find a way out or break up amicably? In the end, I managed to calm down and we talked. If only she had made a simple mistake. I think I would have made an effort to save our marriage. I am aware of my shortcomings, so I would hope for forgiveness if the situation changed to the opposite. But the affair started before Zoe and I got married, and she couldn't even commit to ending it. In the end, Zoe left, but our parting was far from friendly. Surprisingly, Zoe accepted the divorce as it was offered to her and accepted it. She moved her business to New York, and we haven't talked to her since. I wonder what happened to her lover. You mentioned that he had serious problems. Has it affected you in any way? He got a lot of bruises and went through a period of pain, but eventually he managed to recover. Of all the consequences, the scar above his eye bothered him the most, as it posed a threat to his modeling career. Fortunately, even that has passed now. Interestingly, Zoe became my alibi during this incident, as it happened 45 miles from where I ran into Zoe in our dining room. At the beginning, my immediate reaction was a sense of satisfaction that justice had been served, but these emotions quickly dissipated. Although he was a disgusting person, I never desired or initiated such an outcome. Thus, we are talking about two cases. It looks like you chose women of a similar type, but expected different results. I let out a melancholy smile. You sound exactly like my friends. They all tried to convey the same idea to me, but apparently I'm a slow learner, since I followed a similar path after Zoe. Are you kidding? No. I really wish I could be as sad as I should have been. I think you'll find it funny how I found out about Samantha's infidelity. My divorce was officially finalized in October 2016. I decided to go to Dallas to spend Thanksgiving with Aubrey and Dennis, according to our tradition. Air travel was extremely busy that week, and I was stuck at SeaTac Airport for several hours due to numerous delays. As I was sitting in the waiting room engrossed in my beer, a striking blonde suddenly took the seat opposite me. She was deep in conversation on the phone and looked annoyed. Look! She exclaimed with obvious disappointment in her voice. I can't control the actions of the airlines. I cannot storm the gates and demand an immediate departure just because you insist on my timely arrival. The flight is delayed and I will arrive later than expected. As she spoke, her charming dimples danced playfully, causing me to chuckle softly. When she didn't get an answer from the other end, she abruptly broke off the conversation and muttered a few frustrated words under her breath. Suddenly she looked at me and realized that I had accidentally overheard her conversation and assumed that I was laughing at her. Are you making fun of me? She asked, her voice filled with concern. Oh no, I'm sorry if it seemed that way. I quickly apologized, genuinely surprised by her assumption. I didn't want to eavesdrop on your conversation. Curiosity got the better of me, and she began to question me further, demanding to know the reason for my laughter. Caught off guard, I decided that honesty was the best policy. Well, I couldn't help but notice your amazing, beautiful dimples, I admitted with a note of admiration. They really come to life and give your face a charming charm, especially when you are passionately arguing. Fortunately, her laughter and rosy cheeks were accompanied by an attempt to hide her charming dimples. Unfortunately, my mother knows how to test my patience with her self-centered behavior. She firmly believes that the whole universe revolves around her carefully thought-out schedule and for some reason considers me responsible for being late. It's just one of those quirks that mothers have. Are you all, right? Of course I adore my mom, but the hassle of air travel is already frustrating and then I have to put up with her current attitude. Your phone is ringing, it's her. Believe me, I'm protecting her feelings, preferring not to respond. I'm feeling pretty irritable right now and I can't guarantee that I'll choose my words wisely. Would you mind if I bought you a drink that would help improve your mood? 
a drink offered by a stranger. She gave me an innocent, childish expression, accompanied by a shy smile showing off her dimples. I usually don't accept drinks from strangers. Well, my name is Luke, and you? She laughed a little, smiled and jokingly exclaimed with a note of annoyance, I'm Samantha or Sam to my friends, so now we're not complete strangers. What can I get you to drink, Sam? We talked for almost two hours before it was time for me to board the plane. Her wit and charm fascinated me. Although she didn't have the striking beauty of Harper or Zoe, she radiated undeniable attractiveness. When the airline announced the landing, I couldn't help but feel a note of regret. Sam, they're starting to board my flight, I said, slightly saddened. I really enjoyed our conversation. Do you happen to live in the Seattle area? Yes, she replied. I live in Redmond, not far from here. And you? I'm in Kirkland, a stone's throw from here, I replied. Encouraged by our connection, I decided to take a leap of faith. If you don't mind me saying ahead of time, are you in a relationship right now? I would love the opportunity to treat you to dinner and get to know you better. I was even more fascinated by her charming wrinkle on her nose, which made me think she was even cuter. Wow, you're fast, but you're also quite nice, so I don't mind, she remarked. Okay, give me your phone. Sure, here you go, I replied, handing her my phone. Okay, my contact information is saved under the name Sam. Feel free to call me anytime after my return next Wednesday. Thank you, I said, surprised at how happy I felt despite having to wait for my flight. Her laugh was incredibly alluring, and it made her seem even more attractive to me. The same thing. I might even be in a good enough mood to finally answer my mom's call. We hugged, and at that moment it seemed to me that I had ascended into the heavenly kingdom. When she pulled away from our embrace, her gaze settled on me. Do you really appreciate my dimples, or was it just a remark? What is it? She asked, looking for sincerity. Believe me, I really, really adore them, I assured her. Luke, please don't become some kind of weird person. I would not want to resort to physical confrontation, she warned. Although judging by her laughter, she did not really believe that such a thing could happen. Don't worry, I'm so ordinary that I'm afraid you'll get bored more than anything. I reassured her. The flight was, to put it mildly, wonderful. I felt so consumed by desire, longing for love on the horizon, that a private jet became almost unnecessary. The interaction between us was undeniable. Upon arrival in Dallas, Dennis met me at the airport, and I couldn't help but notice how good he looked. While we were driving to their house, he shared the incredible news about his remission. Dennis, a truly exceptional man, deserved only the best, and I couldn't help but be glad and relieved to hear that he was on the road to recovery. In addition to three children, Dennis and Aubrey created a warm and welcoming home that had everything I ever wanted for myself. Love permeated every corner of their home. At the end of our visit, Aubrey cooked a delicious dinner and, taking the opportunity, shared her wisdom, gently admonishing me for my past choice of partner and urging me to look for a woman with a sincere character and not one who is absorbed in self-absorption. Reflecting on Sam's potential classification, I refrained from contacting her until Thursday, when we both returned to our homes. Initially, I was counting on a short conversation to arrange a date, but to my surprise, our conversation turned into a protracted marathon lasting two and a half hours. At the end of the conversation, I remembered my teenage years, and my head was in the clouds. A huge grin graced my face, and I totally cherished this moment. At that moment, I realized that I wanted to get it. The desire to get her for our upcoming date was irresistible. I was overwhelmed with anxiety and had to fight the temptation to leave too soon. Her apartment was only three miles from mine, and I assumed that in the coming months, I would have to spend a significant amount of time traveling between our houses. Our first date took place at one of my favorite places, Matt's Rotisserie and Oyster House Restaurant. The conversation flowed easily, and I was captivated by her gaze. Luke, 
You cannot understand how great my desire is for you to visit my home, but I'd rather not rush things. Is that okay with you? Of course, I think so. You're still in the process of recovering from your marriage, so don't rush things. I appreciate your understanding. You are a much more sympathetic person than I trust you to be, she said, raising an eyebrow and smiling at me. I was tempted to make a cheeky remark about the fact that my stomach is not small at all, but I quickly realized that this would be inappropriate, given our decision not to rush things. I giggled nervously, trying to hide my sudden anxiety. No, saying something like that would undoubtedly change the course of our relationship. Let's let events unfold naturally and slowly. That's fine with me. At first, a cold shower helped for a while, but as Christmas approached, we both realized that we were deeply in love and could no longer contain our emotions. So, a few months later, Sam moved in with me, which perfectly coincided with Valentine's Day. It was very clear that we were devoted to each other, and our relationship was developing rapidly. We decided to have a small, intimate wedding in the summer because we were confident in our future together. Sam was involved in volleyball and continued to actively engage in various sports such as hiking, kayaking, and cycling. On weekends, when we weren't busy in the bedroom, our time was filled with various physical activities such as cycling and running. Inspired by the fact that my partner attends a nearby gym, I also decided to join him. To turn our workouts into a friendly competition, I bought Fitbits for both of us, and also downloaded an iPad app that allowed us to track our fitness progress individually. Our desire to improve our physical condition as a couple has led to the fact that I have achieved the best shape in my life. Our wedding was scheduled for the first Saturday in August, and we sent out invitations to our next of kin and a few select friends. In addition, Melanie, who worked as my personal assistant, was supposed to attend the celebration with her husband. Aubrey and Dennis were already on their way and had flown in to take part in the gala event. I was sure that everything had been planned perfectly this time, and I was looking forward to the moment when Sam would officially become Mrs. Riley. The wedding was intimate, attended by only 37 carefully selected guests. Fortunately, Sam did not succumb to the stress that brides-to-be often suffer from. Her sister took on the role of bridesmaid, refusing additional escorts. To simplify the situation and avoid logistical difficulties, we decided to hold the ceremony right in the reception hall. Thus, we got rid of the need for transportation and saved valuable time. Standing next to the priest, I waited anxiously for my beloved bride to come to me. Before the start of the procession, I carefully watched the guests, looking for familiar faces. Melanie caught my attention among the crowd. She was sitting a few rows back, and her face was shining with happiness as she looked at me. But Aubrey and Dennis were nowhere to be seen, and that made me a little uneasy. I hoped they didn't have any problems with the flight. During the ceremony, we exchanged vows, sealed our commitments with a kiss, and began a joyful celebration. But as the reception progressed, my anxiety about Aubrey and Dennis's absence intensified. About two hours after the celebration began, my phone suddenly vibrated, indicating an incoming text message. It was from Orby, and her words struck me with a mixture of sadness and shock. Luke, I'm really sorry that we couldn't attend your special day. I didn't want to burden you with worries or overshadow your celebration, but unfortunately Dennis's cancer has made itself felt again. He was admitted to the hospital yesterday. Don't worry, it's okay, but I'm upset that I couldn't support you. Call me as soon as you get back from your honeymoon. I informed Sam about this, who agreed that I should contact Aubrey immediately. Without delay, I dialed Aubrey's number, and although she tried to calm me down, our deep understanding of each other made it clear that Dennis was in trouble. Her fear was too obvious to hide. Meanwhile, Sam and I were enjoying our honeymoon in Hawaii, trying our best not to dwell on the problems Dennis and Aubrey were facing alone. The trip was truly wonderful, and I found solace in Sam's compassionate nature and her ability to meet my emotional and physical needs. In mid-September, a few weeks after our adventure, 
Sam and I took a plane to Dallas to spend a long weekend visiting Dennis and Aubrey. When I entered their house, I was overwhelmed by the affectionate hugs of their son and two daughters, who eagerly welcomed their beloved Uncle Luke. But most of all, I caught my breath at the sight of Dennis. The once sturdy and strong athlete from our high school football team now looked frail and thin, and his pale complexion was draining the life out of him. As I watched him, it was obvious that death loomed ominously over him. I tried my best to hide my shock and tried to treat my friend the same as always. After dinner, Sam helped Aubrey wash the dishes, and Dennis took me aside to his cubicle. Luke, I guess you've already figured out that I can't get over this, he admitted. I urged him to remain steadfast, reminding him that life is a battle that we all end up losing, my dear friend. I've come to terms with it. Aubrey and the kids worry me the most, he admitted. They will be financially provided for. I have taken care of that. But promise me you'll keep an eye on them, okay? I think they'll decide to stay in Dallas, but it's important for the kids to keep in touch with Uncle Luke, and Aubrey needs to have a best friend around. You didn't have to ask, I assure you. You know how much I care about you, don't you? Of course I do. The feelings are mutual. Luke, you are a very kind person and a true friend. My voice was shaking uncontrollably, and I couldn't help but wonder if it was acceptable for men to show their emotions. Dennis found it difficult to find words. His throat was visibly constricted. That's what real men do, my friend. Can silence cause warmth and sadness at the same time? For a short period, this was the prevailing emotion, until Dennis shifted the focus. By the way, Sam looks amazing. I sincerely wish you both to live your whole lives in joy and contentment. But just two weeks later, Dennis left this world. The funeral and burial took place in Washington, where their families lived. Aubrey and the children spent several weeks seeking solace in our company while we tried to help them through this difficult period. Once again, Sam proved herself to be an exceptional and supportive partner in this turmoil. A few months later, Sam approached me with an intriguing offer. Have you heard about Hugh, the gym owner? He is thinking about retirement and asks if we are interested in acquiring his property. To be honest, this opportunity is more in line with my personal aspirations than my current career at Microsoft. It's a dream I've always had and something I'm really passionate about. But I don't want to change my profession because I have already established myself in my current field. Have you thought about taking on this case yourself? Maybe I could help you? Well, I could probably try to do it on my own, but I don't have the necessary funds. Maybe I can help you financially. What exactly does Hugh require? I can afford to pay the price he's asking for the business, but he also wants to sell me the building. I don't currently have the $2 million needed for this part, and I don't believe I can get that amount. Given the significant growth in my portfolio, I was thinking about setting up an LLC to invest in real estate, which would give me more opportunities to diversify. That's why I started creating an LLC, which I called Riley Investments. In addition, Sam has established a separate LLC in her name for the gym. After that, Riley Investments provided her with a line of credit to support the necessary improvements and take into account fluctuations in operating costs in the early years of her business. Our accountant and lawyer jointly drew up agreements, as a result of which we launched our new businesses without any problems. Microsoft, recognizing Sam's experience, offered her a lucrative consulting opportunity, which we carefully considered, weighing all the advantages and disadvantages. In the end, we came to the conclusion that the additional income would help stabilize her financial situation. It quickly became obvious that the new business was destined to be a huge success. At the same time, combining responsibility for owning a business and fulfilling obligations to Microsoft, which was sometimes associated with business trips, became a serious burden for Sam. Despite this, she had the necessary energy to plunge headlong into solving these problems. But I had to help her at the gym if she needed help while out of town. Despite this, we were happy with each other and even started discussing the idea of starting a family. Sam thought it was possible if she eventually left her job at Microsoft. 
Shortly after our first anniversary, Sam had to travel to Atlanta for three days to support a software development project. As usual, we talked every evening and exchanged details of our days. On the second evening of the trip, she called me around 3 p.m. West Coast time or 6 p.m. Atlanta time. Hi Sam, how was your day? I asked. We have achieved significant success, but there is still a lot of work ahead. I apologize for the limited communication time, as some team members need to continue working during dinner. Can I do it tomorrow? Of course. Since I'm going to the gym tonight to assess the situation, I might as well go and see how the staff is coping. It sounds like a good plan. I love you, darling. I love you, too. After going to the gym, I decided to work out before checking out the office. I was pleased with the progress and ended up staying to guard the premises at 9 in the evening. I had the urge to call Sam, but it was well past midnight in her time zone, and I was sure she had had a tiring day. In an effort to pass the time, I decided to play a game on the iPad after a quick shower. When I was browsing my apps, the Fitbit app caught my attention, and I decided to evaluate my progress. When I opened the app, a wave of horror swept over me, depriving me of colors. A surge of agony twisted my gut as I witnessed the undeniable proof that my life was crumbling. Sam, apparently, was actively involved in sports. But why would she do that at almost 1 o'clock in the morning in her time zone? The more I delved into the details, the more familiar the picture became. I immediately caught her intentions and felt the need to contact her. But at the first attempt to reach her, her mobile phone rang until it went to voicemail. It was weird because she had set a unique ringtone specifically for my calls, so she had to find out who was calling. Despite several attempts, her phone kept switching to voicemail. In the end, on the fifth attempt, Sam finally picked up the phone. Baby, is everything okay? What is it? She asked. No, it's not okay, I replied. Worried, she asked if I was injured and if I was in the hospital. Injured? Yes, I am badly injured, I said. Worried, she asked to explain what had happened. What's his name? I asked. Confused, she replied. What's their name? What are you talking about? The guy you're writing? Tell me, please. What is his name? What are you saying? Please share it with me, Sam. Luke, I don't understand. What happened? Where are you? Will you answer my question? Oh, how did you know? Next time you want to have fun with someone other than your spouse, take off your Fitbit. I abruptly interrupted the call, turned off the phone, and angrily threw it across the room. Sleep was out of the question. I decided to take a walk to calm down. I couldn't believe it was happening again. How can I keep finding unfaithful wives for myself? When I returned home, I set myself a number of predefined tasks. Although we kept separate households, we shared several accounts and credit cards for household expenses. Going to the computer, I combined the funds from these accounts into one of my personal accounts and then closed those that could be serviced online. Late in the evening, I wrote a letter to my law firm asking for an urgent appointment with a divorce lawyer. The next day, I decided to take a vacation from work to put my affairs in order. After preparing the printed divorce documents, I made an appointment with the accountant. I decided to seek the help of a lawyer to begin the process of applying for a loan to Sam for the gym. This provision was clearly spelled out in the loan documents allowing me to claim the entire amount of the principal with 60 days' notice. How could I be such a fool? My whole being was filled with agony, and I longed for her to experience the same pain, and maybe even more. The vindictive part of me wanted to destroy her completely. After that incident, I did not communicate with Sam, and did not know about her plans to return home. Worse, in a fit of frustration, I dropped and destroyed my phone, which led to the need to buy a new one. On the new device, I immediately blocked Sam's number. In a difficult moment, I turned to Aubrey for support. She gave me comfort and encouraged me to let go of my vindictive tendencies. Aubrey became my moral compass, even when I resisted it, but promised myself to try. 
When I thought about going to the pub, I hesitated, because Sam could have returned according to our original plans. I wanted to sort out the situation and hope to be home before she arrived. Unfortunately, luck wasn't on my side when I walked in and saw Sam, who was crying uncontrollably. She rushed to me, trying to hug me, but I instinctively pushed her away. Don't touch me, Sam, I said, my voice full of anguish. Oh, please, I'm sorry. Please forgive me, she begged. I beg you this will never happen again. Don't leave me, please. I don't want to lose you. Lose it? No, you threw us out. Luke, please, I was stupid. I was thinking. I was thinking. What did you think? That you can get away with anything, or that I won't mind? Or your brain told you that it doesn't matter if you break our vows, or that you can handle the consequences, or that you can disrespect me while you're sleeping with someone else, and it won't change anything. Or maybe you thought that there would be a guy with more experience or a better lover for you. Is that so? No, no. What kind of stupid idea did you come up with? Come on, explain to me why you thought it made sense. It didn't make any sense, it was just mindless, casual contact. Seriously, random? Are you kidding? How often do you engage in casual intimacy, huh? Fooling around with guys at the gym? Having affairs in public toilets? I can't understand how you could even consider that as an excuse. I just believe that you were trying to convince me that you had thought everything through carefully. Please, Luke, help us forget about this. Let me put it briefly, my dear. You allowed another man, who remains unnamed, to enter into an intimate relationship with you, which is intended only for me. Please don't try to convince me that this is your body and you can do whatever you want with it. It belongs to both of us. And our marriage broke up the moment he slept with you and it hurts me deeply. I couldn't help but feel perverse satisfaction watching her torment. Please pull yourself together, calm down and listen carefully. The divorce papers will be handed to you within the next few days. Please refuse the divorce. I need your help. Please listen to me. The terms of the marriage contract regarding infidelity come into force. If you decide to continue, you will get very little from our breakup. Besides, I demand repayment of the loan. The amount of debt is just over $350,000. You have 60 days to pay off the debt, otherwise the ownership of the gym will pass to me. No, Luke, please understand the consequences this will have for me. I beg you to listen to me. I will insist on paying off the loan only if you agree to sign the divorce papers. If you decide to resist, I will pursue anything and everything. It's not about money or the gym, all I need is you. Let's find a way to deal with this together, please. You were well aware of my painful past involving unfaithful spouses. You promised that you would never subject me to the same mental pain, and yet a year later you broke that promise. It will be very difficult to restore my trust, especially since you have shown such disrespect for me knowing what an emotional shock it will cause. Luke, I have to admit that I made a significant mistake in my decision. I'm far from perfect, but so are you. Can you honestly say that you have never desired the company of another woman? Despite my anger, I tried my best to stay calm, biting my lips so hard that the taste of blood appeared in my mouth. Yes, I am aware of my shortcomings. Each of us has our own fantasies, the crucial difference is that you acted according to your own, which I would never have done. Please stop your persuasion. This causes me great suffering, especially considering our plans to start a family. Do you really believe that I want my children to have a mother with thoughts like yours? I strive to raise kind, decent, moral and loving children who will make a positive contribution to this world. I don't want their lives to be influenced by someone who is capable of doing things like you have done. When she started wailing again, I didn't want to listen to her anymore. I left, assuring her that I would be back in a day or two and we could both calm down. It was incredibly hard to leave behind the woman you love, who is now devastated and sobbing uncontrollably on the floor. At first I wanted her to experience the same devastation as me, but I was overwhelmed with guilt for abandoning her. Moreover, I needed to leave before I succumbed to my own emotional breakdown. 
I didn't want her to witness this. A few days passed and I was able to calm down. Eventually we talked, and I reluctantly agreed to go to counseling in the hope of saving our relationship. But I still wasn't sure if I could bring back that deep sense of connection that we once shared. After six weeks of counseling we drove home from our last appointment, and oddly enough, Sam was unusually silent. I stole a glance at her, noticing how gentle tears were flowing down her cheeks. Unlike most guys I was not very observant, but at that moment I felt that something big was about to happen. Without exchanging a single word, we entered the house, shrouded in eerie silence. Sam's voice broke the silence. Can we sit down and talk? I need to share a story with you. Offering her comfort, I readily took a seat on the couch, realizing that she needed to avoid direct eye contact. A heavy sigh escaped Sam's lips as she tried to regain her composure and prepared to begin her story. When I was a kid, I was a little girl. I was very attached to my father and our relationship was incredibly special. He played the role of the hero that every father should be, and I carried the coveted title of his princess. Whether we were watching a movie together or just relaxing with the whole family after dinner, my sister and I always found solace by cuddling up to him on the couch. Our intimacy did not weaken even during my rebellious teenage years. At the age of 16, I made a solemn vow of purity to my father, vowing to keep myself for marriage. This commitment was not frivolous. Every word had a deep meaning for me. In our church, such events were quite common in the days of my childhood. It may seem funny now, but back then it was an important part of our lives. I started a romantic relationship with a classmate of my Sunday school. After we had been dating for about a year, he began to persistently demand intimacy from me. Finally, on my 18th birthday, I gave in to his request, and this entailed a number of unforeseen consequences. I was unable to satisfy the newly arisen desire. One evening, the rest of my family had to attend a banquet, leaving my boyfriend and me alone at home. Naturally, we wasted no time and ended up in bed even before the family car drove away from the entrance. After about 15 minutes I looked up and saw my father standing in the doorway and looking right at us. He was diabetic and forgot his insulin, which made him come back for it. His mouth trembled as if on the verge of speaking, but instead he walked away silently. Not knowing what to say, I hurriedly covered myself and followed him. Just as he was about to leave through the front door, he turned to me. His eyes filled with tears, and I was overcome by a sudden surge of emotion. I was paralyzed, unable to move. Then, calming down, he said, You're already a grown woman, and you can make your own decisions. With that, he left. He looked calm, but deep down, it broke my heart. His eyes looked at me with the same ghostly gaze that night and every day after that until his death. Previously, whenever he looked at me, there was an unmistakable expression of love in his eyes. His eyes twinkled, indicating our connection. But since that fateful night, that look has disappeared. When his gaze met mine, it seemed that he only saw me with my boyfriend, a sight that no father should see. When Sam talked about her painful past, tears and suffering were reflected on her face. A shiver ran down my spine as I realized why she felt the need to share this terrible story with me. Although I really wanted to intervene, I decided to keep silent and give her the opportunity to finish her story. From that moment on, our hugs are a thing of the past. Of course, we continued to exchange warm hugs when meeting or saying goodbye, but the close bond between father and daughter disappeared. Although we still treated each other with tenderness, our relationship turned into an ordinary father and daughter relationship. Luke, I see the same look in your eyes that my father has when I look into them now. Every time you look at me, it's like you're imagining me with an unknown man going through the pain of my betrayal. I can feel how desperately you want everything to go back to normal but you can't help but feel it. I want to apologize because I'm not holding on to the past to punish you or anything like that. No matter what, I still love you deeply. 
I understand that you believe the opposite, but this expression of doubt will remain. No matter how much you want to trust me, you can't. Despite my attempts to prove my loyalty and assure you that I will never cheat again, deep down you will always be afraid that a cheater is always a cheater, and none of us can do anything about it. I have caused irreparable damage to what we had, and it is impossible to restore it. What do you suggest? Are you suggesting we surrender? I'm suggesting that you deserve someone you can truly trust, and I deserve to find someone who will treat me the same way you treated me before my betrayal. We both need to go our separate ways, that's what I'm suggesting. When we were sitting at the bar, Linda's emotions were on edge. Silent tears flowed down her cheeks, reflecting the pain I felt going through that nightmare. Leaving Sam in the house, I sought solace in the pub. When I walked in, Kaylee immediately sensed how excited I was. Wiping away her tears, she began to talk about the events of that evening. At that moment, I noticed Luke coming in, and it was obvious that he was on the verge of breaking down too. I called Pete urgently, asked him to look after the bar and quickly took Luke into the office. As soon as the door slammed, he fell into my arms, uncontrollably bursting into tears. Linda focused on her beer, understanding the depth of his emotions. I could empathize with his suffering by experiencing it for myself. Kaylee comforted me and had long, heartfelt conversations with me. Gradually, she managed to bring a note of laughter to my devastated state, as a result of which I got a nickname, Three Betrayals to the Wind. Kaylee believed that I would survive this ordeal and assured me that eventually I would be able to release this pain, as I had already done twice. Determined, I vowed never to find myself in such a vulnerable position again. I understood him so deeply that I couldn't believe that he would lead a lonely life, but I convinced myself that he needed to be alone. Linda gently placed her hand on mine, a faint smile gracing her face. But it looks like you're doing well. In fact, it seems to be not just good. You make me feel optimistic. I recently moved here to start from scratch, and it seems that fate brought us together so that you could share your story with me. Now you radiate happiness. It finally dawned on me that I'm constantly making the same mistake. When I chose to practice intimacy, image, and instant gratification, rather than shared values and respect, it was like I was transported to high school. Unfortunately, I couldn't appreciate the perfect woman who was right in front of me and instead kept looking for the wrong thing. At that moment, you remembered Aubrey. A smile appeared on my face as I closed my eyes, acknowledging that it had been months before I was ready to let go of Sam and move forward. Deep down, I knew that the woman I really needed and desired was always my closest friend. So you ended up going to Dallas? Absolutely, yes. But I was careful with her because I wasn't sure if she had survived Dennis's death. Despite this, we stayed in touch, and I was constantly trying to find the right moment to express my love to her. Kaylee, my confidant, was there to listen. I finally decided to tell Kaylee about my plans to visit Aubrey, and I even had tickets booked. But then, everything took an unexpected turn. It happened four weeks before I discovered that I had woken up after a restless night. Technically, I can't say that I woke up because I wasn't really asleep, but around three o'clock in the morning I got up with a new determination. I tossed and turned all night, unable to find peace. I have made up my mind. My destination was Dallas, where I intended to confess my feelings to Aubrey. If everything goes according to plan, I will return home engaged to the woman I have cherished in my heart for as long as I can remember. Having made this firm decision, I could not sleep, as I struggled with my fears and was looking forward to the meeting. Despite my complete confusion, I was unwavering in my determination to find out if she reciprocated my feelings. Friday morning greeted me with dawn. I knew that I had work responsibilities, so I hurried to the office and feverishly completed all the necessary tasks, having managed to buy a plane ticket to go to Dallas the next day. It took longer than expected to complete the tasks. 
but by 4 o'clock in the afternoon I managed to finish them. I went to the pub to tell Kaylee about my plans. You're early today, Luke, she said with a smile. I won't be able to stay long, but I had to let you know that I finally decided to see Aubrey. I need to tell her something, I explained. Well, you don't have to, Kaylee replied. Listen, I need to hurry up and get ready. I want to go to a jewelry store to show up with a ring in my hands. Luke, please listen, Kaylee interrupted. Thank you for all your help. I couldn't have done it without you. I tried to speak, but Kaylee interrupted me. Luke, just stop talking and listen. I have to deliver these drinks. But if you could just be quiet and turn around, I think you'll understand that there's no need to fly to Dallas. What? What are you trying to say? Look at the stand next to the toilets. I'll be back soon. I obediently turned around and my heart began to pound, only to fall into the void a moment later. Glancing at Aubrey's profile, I immediately recognized her. She was sitting with another man and holding hands across the table. Their smiles spoke of a shared affection, and my stomach ached. I hurriedly left the bar. I was in a state of shock. My mind was completely overloaded. I couldn't connect even the simplest thoughts. Trying to escape, I turned off my phone and drove aimlessly through the city, overcome with self-pity. My thoughts wandered along different tangents until tears blurred my vision, and it became increasingly difficult to see the road ahead. Then I realized that I had accidentally driven into West Seattle, and in search of solace, I headed to Alka Beach. When I finally managed to find a parking spot, my eyes watered from the burning sensation. I parked the car and sat crying like a helpless baby, gradually regaining control of my emotions. I went out on the sidewalk by the beach and sat down, watching the sun sink below the horizon, flooding the water with serene light. Thoughts whirled through my head, making it impossible to concentrate, and I felt completely lost. It must have been closer to midnight when I finally gathered my strength and returned home. After taking a refreshing shower and getting dressed, I got behind the wheel and drove to the office around 1 o'clock in the morning in the hope of distracting myself. The late hour reflected the gloomy mood that had gripped me, and I gladly accepted the loneliness that awaited me during the day. It was exactly what I craved at that moment. Unfortunately, apart from canceling my travel plans, I have not achieved anything meaningful. After taking a short nap on the couch in the office, I found that I couldn't find answers to my questions while looking out the window from my desk chair. Should I let her out of my hands? Or should I fight to have her by my side? The right and wrong paths collided inside me, and I was paralyzed by indecision. Eventually, around two o'clock in the afternoon, I went to the pub to meet Kaylee. It dawned on me that I had left the night before without talking to her, even after she had warned me about Aubrey's presence on a date. Naturally, she should have been worried. When I entered the pub, Kaylee's eyes immediately met mine. I was struck by the expression on her face. It wasn't what I expected. Instead of worrying about my well-being, she looked visibly angry. What were you thinking running away from here like that? she exclaimed. You made me worry, you fool. I need to finish delivering drinks, but you better stay here until I get back. The words she said were changed to protect her innocence. Knowing that Kaylee never uses profanity, especially towards me, I chose to remain silent. I couldn't help but wonder what had caused her such excitement. She continued to frown, shaking her head and muttering to herself. After dealing with the other customers, Kaylee directed her evil gaze at me. It took her about 10 minutes to finish her business before she finally came over to me. It was obvious that she was trying to control her emotions before speaking. I was speechless from fear because I thought I was a complete idiot. I thought you were going to Aubrey's table, but instead you walked out the door quickly. In a trembling voice, I managed to mumble, I am... I couldn't. Abruptly interrupting me, she hissed, Shut up. You spent months, no years, professing your love for Aubrey, and yet you ran away without even talking to her. I warned you. What was it about? About her. 
You should know that I love her more than anything in the world. I made the decision to go to Dallas, express my feelings to her and ask her to marry me. In my heart I have already dedicated my whole life to Aubrey, the woman I have loved deeply since childhood. I'm willing to do anything to make her mine. But when you warned me by pointing to the place where she was sitting with her boyfriend, it dawned on me that Aubrey might have other plans with this guy. Kaylee's expression softened noticeably, but then I noticed that she wasn't looking at me but rather over my shoulder. When I felt a gentle touch on my back and heard a voice that sounded like heavenly delight, I couldn't help but wonder if you, Luke, really feels that way about me. For almost two decades, I've been looking forward to the day when you say those words. In an instant, I turned around on the bar stool, and Aubrey hugged me, joining our hearts and minds in a deep union of love. Despite three failed marriages and various other relationships, it took me just one sincere kiss to finally comprehend the wisdom that my father instilled in me many years ago. There was no doubt in my mind, Aubrey was the one I was looking for all this time. She was the love that I always craved and needed. Tears were streaming down Linda's face. You almost missed the woman of your dreams again, Kaylee said. I turned to look at my beloved. After a short pause, Kaylee giggled and cleared her throat. Ah, you two want some privacy, she teased. Aubrey smiled back. We'll definitely use this in a few days, won't we, honey? Tears glistened on Linda's cheeks and she smiled. You're a beautiful couple, Kaylee praised. Oh, I'm sorry. Linda, I want you to meet my fiancé. Hi, Linda. Luke's not acting like that. I'm Aubrey, she introduced herself. Linda's eyes filled with tears of joy. Aubrey... I'm really glad to finally meet you. Luke has been admiring you all evening. I have to say, if he had ended up with someone else it would have been the most disappointing story in the world. It's wonderful when school sweethearts find their way to each other, Linda said with a smile. I looked at her tenderly. I was only talking about you. You're the only thing that matters to me, I said when I felt his gentle kiss again. You're so kind, she replied meeting Linda's gaze which raised her eyebrows. We weren't lovers but rather best friends. It was important for me to make this distinction. Deep down we both wanted to be more than just friends, but we faced difficulties when we had to overcome this gap. Bree grinned and added, To be honest, Luke had a mischievous teenage side and I was too focused to be the subject of his research. I couldn't deny her words. Sometimes I wondered how our relationship might have developed if I had grown up faster. My feelings for her have always been sincere and unshakable. She met those women who possessed her physical attractiveness, but they lacked depth, and they could never match the personality that she was and remains. Indeed, Aubrey, Luke appreciated your beauty very accurately. Both of you are too generous with compliments. The only thing that really matters is that when I look into his eyes, I feel a deep connection between our hearts. I am sure of his unconditional love for me and consider myself incredibly happy. Linda squeezed Aubrey's hand tightly and gave us a worried look. Wait, what happened to your previous boyfriend? Aubrey looked at her and smiled sympathetically. Don't worry, there's no boyfriend. That man you saw with me is actually my cousin Paul. I stayed with him and his wife while I was looking for a place. I could call home in the area. You see, I've already made the decision to come back, and I was hoping that Luke, who is here, would finally have the courage to propose to me. Linda's face brightened and she laughed, wiping tears from her eyes. You are such a sweet couple. I must admit that I looked at Luke for a while, but now I see that it's not so easy anymore. I recently moved here from California, I want to start from scratch and hope to find new friends. Perhaps a real soulmate is waiting for you. I hope there are a few more people like Luke at my age. Kaylee reached across the bar and took my shoulder and held Linda's hand with the other. Linda, you have three new friends here now, she announced. Aubrey added, by all means, you must attend the wedding on Saturday, especially since you are new here. In response, she said, you're very kind but I don't want to impose. Aubrey reassured her, the presence of two of your three friends in the Seattle area at the Union celebration 
is not an imposition. We'll be offended if you don't come. In addition, most of those present will be from this region. I guarantee that if you come, you will make a lot of new friends. Well, you've convinced me. Luke, dear, please text her the details. You really are the most charming couple. Isn't it unfortunate that you both had to go through difficult times to get to this point? I cannot speak on behalf of Luke, but I believe that these experiences were necessary for him to gain clarity. As for me, I wouldn't trade anything for the time I spent with Dennis and the happiness our three children brought me. I love this man with every fiber of my being. Starting a relationship with Luke doesn't really matter, and there's a chance it wouldn't have worked out anyway. But the timing was perfect, and I believe that everything happens for a reason. My love for Luke has always remained as strong as my love for Dennis. I am incredibly lucky to have two amazing men who have brought love into my life. It really pleases the heart. It's amazing that you're finally together, someone exclaimed. It's not surprising, it's a conspiracy, I replied, rubbing my head after Aubrey playfully hit me. It turns out that Kaylee and Aubrey organized everything behind my back. That's partly true, Kaylee agreed. After Luke and Sam ended their relationship, I contacted Aubrey. Despite the fact that Luke had already informed her about it, I made it clear that I was not going to discuss their breakup. Instead, I asked about the possibility of their reconciliation in the future. Aubrey giggled as she got to the story. It's been 11 months since Dennis died, and I wasn't ready to dive into a new novel. Admittedly, the idea of being with Luke had crossed my mind before, but I didn't believe that either of us was emotionally ready for a new relationship, especially considering his recent breakup. Luke and I kept in regular contact, talking at least once a week, and I could feel the hidden emotions of anger and pain in his voice. Realizing the importance of healing, I advised Kaylee to focus on her own path to recovery, because I knew that Luke sought comfort in her presence almost every night. With each call from Luke, I was looking forward to seeing signs of his progress, since I had already made the decision that I wanted to get him. I expected that by the time I was healed enough, he would be ready to move forward too. But when Aubrey paused for a moment, I couldn't resist intervening. Within six months I realized that my thoughts were only with Aubrey, leaving no room for anyone or anything else. I even considered quitting my job and moving to Dallas to start my own business, all in hopes of building a future with Aubrey. He didn't know that I was already planning to return home to Kirkland. But let's keep this between us, dear. So, where was I? So, they agreed that Aubrey would surprise me at the bar, but he almost ruined everything with his sudden disappearance. Kaylee, honey, you and the lady shouldn't let a man interrupt the course of history. My apologies. Please continue. As I said, that's when I almost ruined everything. I'm sure you're familiar with the rest of the story. When Aubrey came up behind me after Kaylee was swearing, it was like a sudden transition from total darkness to radiant light. Before I could say a word or turn my chair around completely, Aubrey's words resonated with me, and I was involved in the deepest and most passionate kiss of my entire existence. This kiss, my dear, was like no other. Every time we kiss, he seems just as wonderful. When we finally broke away from each other, Aubrey looked into my eyes and asked, prompting me to reveal my true feelings. Do you love me as much as you just confessed to Kaylee, my love? Luke spoke of me with such tenderness. And I responded by fully expressing my love for you and wishing that we could become a family. Aubrey, will you marry me? Four weeks have passed since that moment. Can you imagine? In just four weeks, the two of us managed to plan an entire wedding. Amazing, isn't it? Linda, I've spent 16 years foolishly searching for the woman I've always dreamed of. Deep down, I knew Aubrey was the one I needed. But I let my wrong choice ruin our chances. But we were determined not to waste precious time. Our wedding was truly magnificent. An event that will forever hold a special place in my heart. Aubrey, in my eyes you are the epitome of beauty, and no one can convince me otherwise. It is worth noting that Linda, 
despite everything, attended the wedding. Before the wedding, she devoted a lot of time to establishing contacts with many people. But she paid special attention to getting to know her older brother Aubrey, who turned out to be unmarried. Over time, they began a romantic relationship, and now Linda has become one of our closest friends. I am no longer called Uncle Luke. Instead, the children now affectionately call me Papa Luke. They asked me to call me Dad, to which I replied that I cherish them as my own. But their biological father holds a special place in their hearts, and it is important to remember him as a father. The fact that I was called Papa, or later Papa Luke, suited me perfectly. Aubrey asked about the possibility of a prenuptial agreement, but my answer was firm. Darling, you mean the whole world to me, and I can't imagine that I need a backup plan. Treason is out of the question, because my devotion to you is unprecedented. Marrying you brings me immeasurable happiness beyond anything I could ever imagine. Gone are the days when we married unfaithful partners. Our love is built on trust and loyalty. Perhaps one day our children will write a fairy tale about our journey together, perhaps called Only Four Attempts or something equally witty. On that note, let's discuss our future as parents. We need to redo the nursery. The three women who betrayed me in the past no longer have any power over me. I can say with full confidence that life is really wonderful now.